Hi, everyone, and welcome again to Numbers 412-621-9728. We have a jam-packed lineup of uh, guests today, and I'm sure there's going to be a lot of controversy. And uh, I want you to go to my website at www.totaltutor.org. You can access podcasts of my shows, read my blog, and hear about all the stations that are picking up the Total Education Hour show the Total Education Network is everywhere. And I want to first welcome my two guests. First of all, somebody that I'm just truly amazed and honored to be on the program, Vicki Cobb, author of many different nonfiction children's books. Thanks for calling the program. Hi, Neil. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. I, I was, uh, again, it's so great that you call, are able to call in and provide your expertise. And again, we are both fired up because of how they don't use uh, nonfiction children's books enough in public education. And you're that advocate that we absolutely need to get out there and say, guess what? We can't just teach to this horrible, boring test all the time because kids just don't want to be in school because of it. That's right. All right, do you have your guest on the line? I, I'll have to find out from my producer if yeah, we do. So you can introduce, you brought someone with you today. Yes, I did. I brought a friend of mine, Penny Coleman. She is a fabulous, award-winning author, and she has a new book coming out in May called uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, A Friendship That Changed the World, because, of course, it gave us women the vote. And in addition, Penny has taught graduate school courses in children's literature with a specialty in nonfiction, and she has been a distinguished lecturer at Queens College at the City of University of New York. And I think you're going to enjoy what she has to say. So, hi, Penny. Hi, I'm I'm hearing you faintly, Vicky. <laughs> okay, it's it's very hard sometimes to hear each other. So, can you hear me well? Yes. yes okay. Yes. Okay. So, I'll just let you know and kind of give you what Vicky says. Something. Vicky's going to. You know, chime in in different ways, and I'll kind of reiterate what she says, okay? How's that sound? Because I guess we're going to have to get used to that sometimes with the, the lines and everything. So, Penny, uh, why do you write nonfiction? Well, because I'm curious about the world and everything in it, and nonfiction is infinitely interesting and useful. I mean, everything we do, every, what we talk about, it's nonfiction. So, why not? Absolutely. And... What are six reasons for the hegemony of fiction in K-12 through classrooms? Well, when I became aware of the hegemony of fiction, which was, you know, about 20-some years ago, and I was so astonished it never occurred to me. I'm a nonfiction lover. My three sons are nonfiction lovers. I launched on a mission to find out what are the reasons. And the first I discovered, which really dates back to the 70s, is the emergence of an avidly pro-fiction forces in terms of influential editors, reviewers of children's literature, the gatekeepers who decide what gets published, published and heralded, um, what books get recommended, lists that are compiled, and who sits on award committees. That's certainly one main reason. Another reason that emerged in the 70s was the replacement of the term nonfiction by the term information and informational. And you can pick up children's literature textbooks, and you can actually look in the index and look under nonfiction. And in many children's literature textbooks, it'll put C information or informational. You can actually go into libraries, and you'll see not nonfiction sections. You'll see information and informational. And that was, I, I think, a, a catastrophic um, um, development because the semantic association that people make with information and informational is like reference books, dictionaries. And it totally um, negates the bulk of nonfiction um, literature, which is, you know, full of just exciting biographies and, and you know, the kinds of experiments, the science books that Vicky writes and adventure yes. stories and all the wonderful, wonderful things that are out there for kids. And that still is true today, where where information and informational is used instead of nonfiction. A third reason is the economics of nonfiction. I've had several editors and publishers confess to me that nonfiction is typically more expensive and time-consuming to publish. Um, a fourth reason is, and I found this in my 10 years of teaching teachers who are getting their master's degree, and they certainly don't, you know, when I raise the issue of why they prefer fiction to nonfiction, um, inevitably they will agree that it's emotionally safer. It's safer 
to teach with nonfiction because they and the students can remain detached um, from dissonant and unsettling material. Um, one of the strategies that they use with fiction is they say to kids, well, you know, you can rewrite the ending. Well, w don't, don't we wish we could do that with life? Yes, <laughs> yes. And so that's another reason. The fifth reason is there's a plethora of myths and misconception about nonfiction. It's go, go talk to any group of librarians or teachers, and, and I can guarantee you that they'll, they'll fill the blackboard or fill the easel board with myths and misconceptions, many of which are still widely held. Everything from boys read nonfiction and girls don't, to nonfiction is boring, to nonfiction is just for um, doing research, um, nonfiction is not real reading. The sixth reason which actually just emerged out of my teaching in the last really t couple of years, which is probably one of the more uh, astonishing and sort of tenacious reasons to get at, is that the need for teachers, as one of my students said, to know more, to have yes. to know content. And I, I remember when this came out in one of, one of my classes, I just sort of stood, stood dumbstruck um, because it, it just I couldn't kind of grasp and particularly in the elementary grades when the emphasis in the elementary grade grades is to teach kids skills so with the focus being on skills um, then fiction becomes easier to teach them comprehension skills decoding skills all of those kinds of skills because then the teacher doesn't also have to know content they don't have to know about the subject that the book is is dealing with either the person or the topic or, or whatever, and so the, those are the things that that I've that I've you know with my mission to kind of account for the hegemony of fiction. The six reasons that I've that I've certainly um, put forth and have tested and gotten confirmed by any number of teachers who kind of look at me and say, yes, actually that 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 matches what what has been their experience and why they use fiction over nonfiction. So now when I look when I listen to this penny and I hear what you're talking about I, I say to myself nonfiction again really when I went to graduate school at Duquesne University in elementary education I'd never heard the mention it a lot they never really provided that as something as an option to uh, help students be engaged more but I see how important content is it's not being taught in social studies anymore that's for sure that basically they're teaching skills in social studies and they're forgetting about the history. Wouldn't you agree? Yes, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. And again, and I think that's for for the the, the kinds of reasons that ha have emerged in in terms of my um, mission to try to figure out what what's going on is that it's just really it's just easier. Fiction is easier to teach to teach with. Whatever you're teaching, fiction is easier for teachers, less demanding. I wanted to say that um, I heard that in one state, I'll, I'll leave it unmentioned, that they don't teach um, <clears throat> science until the fourth grade because they have to teach reading. And I mean, and I'll tell you right now, Vicki, I know this is definitely a conversation in social studies because I love social studies because I have my undergrad in history, but science cannot be fun unless you learn the content and understand it. I mean, That's if, right. If you're teaching just skills... How are they going to ever become scientists? How are they going to ever go ahead and go ahead and do those experiments and stuff? Well, you know, it was interesting. I had an experience last night. I picked up my seven-year-old granddaughter, who's in the second grade in a public school in New York, and she was doing her homework, and and she was kind of resistant. And I kind of looked at what she had to do, and I I, I looked at it and I said, "This is boring. It was just like skills-based homework." And what? My granddaughter and every other kid I've ever met when I do school visits or when I just, the youngsters I know, kids want to know stuff. Knowing stuff is what makes them feel empowered and confident and self-assured. That's what kids are craving. They, they want to understand the world. They want to figure yes. out how am I going to survive? How am I going to understand this, this really complex, complex world? I mean, they hear about all these, you know, like the, the, the tsunami, what's going on in Japan. You know, Sophie wanted to understand it. She wanted to know about it. She didn't need skills. She yes. needed to understand, you know, what, what, you know, where is Japan? You know, what is the tsunami? Exactly. You know, that's what kids need. And we disempower.
empower kids from living full and productive and, and, and lives in which they can contribute if we, if we don't provide them with the knowledge base that they need in order to, in order to be competent and, and confident citizens. And the problem is, if you're talking social studies students, a lot of social studies students don't even know where Japan is. They Absolutely. Don't they, don't, they don't know any geography at all, and then they try to just teach boring geography. Yeah. But and I have run the National Geographic Bee for three years, uh -huh. and if our, we had a curriculum like the National Geographic Bee, you would not believe it, Vicky, how engaged these students would be because it's not just looking at a bunch of maps; it's learning about the cultures of the of the people all over the world, learning about what uh, they they dress like, what they eat, what they. Uh, how they worship, the type of weather, things that kids really are interested in, but guess what? Or talking current events. All they do is say, here's a bunch of maps, let's memorize them. They, they have to be put in context, and it has to have a, 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 a humanitarian, humanity basis. It is shared humanity that is the common denominator of all authentic communication. And what we Penny does it in her books, is she gives you the story, the human story behind the facts. The facts by themselves is, are very boring. Exactly. And facts and no story, not interesting. Absolutely. Okay. And what are the antidotes to this whole situation? How are we going to fix this when you're talking about these six reasons? Well, I, I, do you want me to just go quickly through each reason? Sure. That's well, right. we, we, you, the, you're going to be on until about five, so just keep rolling. Okay. So the, for the first reason, the influence of avidly pro-fiction forces, it's to do what Vicky's been doing. It's to mobilize pro-nonfiction forces. And also you, Neil, you're making significant contributions by giving the airtime for us to talk about this. So mobilize pro-nonfiction forces and, you know, get, get everybody to hold students and uh, librarians and teachers accountable for students' choices. This business of using information and informational instead of nonfiction is sort of easy. It's just I actually had a colleague who is the editor of a major ch uh, children's uh, literature textbook, and I raised this issue with her, and we went back and forth and back and forth, and she actually changed the title so that now this children's literature textbook no longer reads informational books. It reads nonfiction books. So. And that's still controversial. I mean, there's been lots of back and forth about the use of nonfiction, that it's a negative, it's a non-word. But I, I, my, one of my favorite quotes is an essayist, a Amy Cruz Rosenthal, who wrote, quote, non-fiction, non-made-up, non-not-true. Um, and that, she says, that non-fiction beckons me with its self-assuring first three letters. And again, that's something kids, think about kids when they come to you and you tell them a story. I bet... Nine times out of ten, the kid will look at you and say, is that true? Did that really happen? Kids want to know the difference between what is and isn't true, what is and isn't made up. The economics of nonfiction, that it's more expensive, well, I think the answer is that all of us who are making decisions about buying books is to make, make sure we allocate some of our resources to buying nonfiction books and to go to use book sales. Yes. It, libraries have them. I mean, I think it's just a matter. Put them on your gift list. Be, be explicit. If you're a teacher and you're wanting books, then be explicit about asking for nonfiction books. There, there are lots of places to get really good lists. There's also lots of free printed information. You know that, Neil, yes. as a historian and a geographer. Museums, historic sites, tourist information centers, you can collect tons of free, excellent printed nonfiction material, right to government agencies, trade associations, yes. there's lots, scour the internet. The fact that it, uh, fiction is emotionally safer than nonfiction, uh, that I agree is true, but I think it's incumbent upon us as adults and as educators to, to face the realities of the world with kids and to not take the easy way out because all the difficulties the difficult issues that kids have to face, I think they will face it in in less stressful, traumatic ways if adults take up the the you know the mantle of dealing with things like death. Um, I've written Corpses, Coffins, and Crypts: The History of Burial. It's one it's one of my books that I've written, and it's a book that that people will say, oh, this is too scary, and then my answer is, well, you know, none of us get out of life alive. We really should deal and talk about this 
when it's not so loaded uh, in the sense of dealing with somebody's death, you know, um, at the time. And so I just am a believer, again, as a, as a mother, as a grandmother, and as an educator, that it's, we're, you know, it's incumbent upon us exactly. as adults to, to, to help kids deal with real-life situations. As I said yeah. earlier, we can't rewrite the ending Exactly. Of life. Oh, oh, you know, you know what's amazing? I, I, was, I was talking to you, Vicki, before. I was only going to have you on for one segment. We definitely want to have you on for a second because... We have just learned so much information, and Vicki, you're right, Penny is just dynamic. I'm learning so much from this interview. Again, uh, I just think the bottom line is, and I want to ask a question, how can we get our new teachers to go out there, and we're gonna, you can answer this question after we take our, a little bit of a break, how can we get new teachers to adopt nonfiction and really say that this is what I need to teach even though these bureaucrats in Washington, D.C. are telling me to teach something different. How can I develop in my uh, teaching toolbox the ability to use books like Vicky's and books like yours, Penny, to really engage these students and also maybe consult in a way to provide more interesting content in textbooks? So we'll, we'll talk about those things when we come back. Again, we're on with Vicki Cobb and Penny Coleman. And Penny and Vicky are fantastic nonfiction children's books writers. And I really didn't know a lot about it until I met you, Vicky. So I really appreciate you connecting me to this. And I'm going to really try to push this everywhere I talk to people, say, you know what? We need children's nonfiction books to be in the center of a classroom, not where they're just in the librarian's Yay. shelf. <laughs> exactly. It's just, it's, it's just, it's terrible what's happening. And, and also, also, Neil, any teacher educators, schools of education, talk to those folks. Too. Oh, I talk definitely. To look at oh, I definitely will. Uh, but we got to take a break. But you're again. Uh, listening to the Toll Education Hour again. I'm the host of the show, Neil Haley, and we'll be back in just a moment. In a world of fear, what they needed most was each other. Here comes the monster. The Tickle Monster! <laughs> Just imagine what a little time can do for your family. <laughs> From the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Our fugitive has been on the run for 90 minutes. Average foot speed over uneven terrain, barring any injuries, is four miles per hour. What I need from each and every one of you is a full target search of every gas station, residence, warehouse, farmhouse, hen house, outhouse, and dog house in that area. Your fugitive has just cashed in his 401k plan. And all he had to do was roll it over. Learn about rollovers and protecting your financial future. And choose to save. You can't mess with a big dog. Everyone, we're back to the Total Education Hour. I'm with Vicki Cobb, award-winning children's nonfiction writer. You wrote many different science books, and also Penny Coleman. Soon to you, you you're another award-winning uh, children's nonfiction writer, and your new book, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony: A Friendship That Changed the World, will be soon out so yeah, may 10th may 10th there'll be that oh i definitely would like to get a chance to interview you on one of my other total education total, Net total education network stations but now the the question we were kind of gauging now is this vicky and you and i have been discussing this in a roundtable discussion about how in public schools in all schools in general children's nonfiction books are in libraries collecting dust 
well, I would say. That, that would be the, the big thing. And now I thought, well, the only way we're going to be able to do this is how Vicky's trying to advocate, and now I'm going to, is to talk to perspect, new prospective teachers to educate them on nonfiction. So the question I want to ask you is, why did you start teaching courses in nonfiction literature in and pre-service teachers? And I think I already have answered your question, but you can tell me a little bit about that. Okay. Well, because I, when I started making school visits and discovered, uh, again, about 20-some years ago, that I was this anomaly, that I was this, you know, kind of strange writer writing this strange thing, that the hegemony of fiction was just absolutely um, impenetrable, uh, I just said, wait a minute, this is outrageous. I'm a nonfiction lover. My sons are nonfiction lovers. My granddaughter, you know, this is insane. So I just took it upon myself uh, to, uh, like Vicky, to start this crusade because I think it's absolutely essential. And so I started teaching at Teachers College at uh, Columbia University, and then I had a, a seven-year term as a distinguished lecturer at Queens College uh, teaching teachers. And the good news is, and by the way, I am a huge fan of teachers and librarians because what I have discovered is if t that teachers and librarians embrace, absolutely embrace, they're hungry to learn about ways to stimulate themselves and to stimulate kids. Nobody wants to be bored. Kids don't want to be bored. Teachers don't want to be bored. And so when they have an opportunity to learn about the incredible wealth of possibilities with nonfiction. They, they embrace nonfiction. Yes. So there's a, some wonderful resources. Of course, the place to start, and I assign this in, in my classes, is of course the Inc. Think Tank website, which has a fabulous database uh, of nonfiction books, a selected group of nonfiction books that are tied to uh, the standards. There are also articles, podcasts. There's also a link on the Inc. Think Tank website to um, Authors on Call, which has even more resources. Um, there's a blog, Interesting Nonfiction for Kids. I have a lot of information on my website, articles and links, um, and that link to other websites. So that's one place to start. And, and I, again, I, I really want to give a shout out to, to certainly all the teachers and librarians and yes. parents who, mm -hmm. who I've been, had the privilege to teach and to talk with over all these many years that, and to really affirm that that when they learn about this incredible research, they, they embrace it. They use their own money to buy the resources. They get up to speed with the content. They, they, they add another book bin. You know, these elementary schools yes. have these bins where they keep books, and so they add a book bin with wonderful nonfiction books, up-to-date books. So it's exciting to be advocating for nonfiction because it's so rewarding. Can I, I just want to interject that um, one of the problems that the teachers have is that the schools are so terrified that they're not meeting the standards, yes. that they're not teaching to the standards that the kids are going to be tested on, they don't realize that they would far surpass the standards if they know what the area is they have to teach. Like if they have to teach about the Revolutionary War, they should use the books in the library. It's, it's, kids don't all have to read the same book on the same on the subject. We're not making widgets in a factory. The kids can read a book that appeals to them and then say why it appeals to them as opposed to another book. But to make everybody read the same assignment and do the same assignment is not what's going to foster an interest in reading or an interest in learning. There, there's another piece, of, too, with all of this which is that the, the research shows that reading scores drop in like the, the third and the fourth grade. And what researchers have discovered is that that's because of the whole lack of, of comprehension. And yes. what is the key ingredient of comprehension? The key ingredient of comprehension is not skills, it's knowledge, it's yes. stuff. And so that, 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 that one of, it seems to me, the, the, the key things that's missing in this testing business is understanding that kids need to know stuff, that, that you can figure out tests a lot better if you have a knowledge mm -hmm. background and base, if you, have, if you know the, the, the knowledge about science and geography and history, that the, the testing then becomes less 
of an issue with the more that you know. And so that's another argument for using good nonfiction that puts forth material, puts forth stories, true stories. Exactly. And uh, again, we're almost running out of time because we're getting close to the five o'clock hour and we'll have to say goodbye. But I really enjoyed this. But one thing I would kind of is how can we advocate? We're going through the schools. We're trying to talk to teachers. But the ultimate thing is through the media and hopefully through the Total Education Network and especially the Total Education Hour and then Vicky posting it all over the place. We're going to get that word and that message out to everyone that, guess what? There are such great authors, especially your authors, Vicki, that provide such wonderful information for students and that you need to be able to engage them. And one thing I'll talk about in teaching, when I first became a teacher, I thought, oh, it's going to be all the creativity out there, okay? I'm going to be able to do all these creative lessons, all these different things. Then you finally find out that's not true at all. You have to teach to a boring textbook. And what we need to do is say that's not going to increase test scores. That's not going to help kids read. So really quickly, Vicki, more information on you and more information on Penny. we got about a minute. Okay. Well, the, the website you should go to is Inc, I-N-K, thinktank.com, and you can enroll in the database. We're going to be starting a new program of what we call Computer Side Chats, where you can talk to us authors directly, interact with us directly. And, Penny, I'll let you give your website information. Right. It's uh, www.pennycoleman.com. No E in Coleman. So it's P-E-N-N-Y-C-O-L-M-A-N. Also, there's a Facebook fan page for Alyssa K. Stanton and Susan B. Anthony. Just do a search for Penny Coleman author. Uh, and, Neil, you're, you're doing a, a, a great thing, and I think the place for teachers to start, honestly, I say this in my classes, is be subversive. Just start one little bit in your classroom to, to just find one way to do a nonfiction read-aloud. That's subversive. Yes. Get a nonfiction book and do a read-aloud. That's a subversive thing. Get the kinds of books that Vicki writes and that all the Ink Think authors write and just put them, have them there available for kids. That's Absolutely. Subversive. All right. I, 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 we have to get going, but thanks, ladies, for calling, and I'll talk to you soon, Vicki. Thank and you, It was great Neil. talking to you, Penny. You're listening to Total Education Hour. We'll Bye. be back in just a moment. My Jamie, she was my baby girl, a precious baby girl. When Jamie was a teenager, she would spend her lunch hours going to the tanning salons. I didn't realize how dangerous they were. If you tan when you're young, your risk for melanoma are increased by 75%. That's huge. What I would say to mothers that allow their daughters to tan. No mother should have to visit their daughter in a cemetery. One person an hour dies from melanoma. Jamie's hour was at one o'clock in the afternoon on Friday, March 16th, 2007. I hope no one else has to mark their hour. This message is brought to you by the American Academy of Dermatology. Back to the Total Education Hour. 
Uh, again, the number is 412-621-9728. Go to my website at www.totaltutor.org. I want to talk about this topic that I think is a hot-button topic. So I think that everyone driving around should think about calling on this one. Tennessee pushes legislation to safeguard anti-evolution teachers. I'll repeat that again. Tennessee pushes legislation to safeguard anti-evolution teachers. And uh, I, we do have Jason on the line. Jason, I'm going to have my guest on in a second, but when you hear that topic really quickly, what do you think? About, uh, about safeguarding evolutionary teaching? Anti. Anti-evolutionary teaching. Well, I mean, let's be honest. This, this is a mountain out of a molehill. I think that there's a... a a, a, a evangelical movement that's trying to uh, say that uh, the that the creationism is uh, on equal footing scientifically with uh, with, with uh, Darwin's theory and evolution. Okay, well, we're waiting on our uh, guest, but the bottom line is, I don't think my guest would believe the same thing. And I'm going to again, his name's Rob Rosselli, and uh, I think he's on the line. Rob, are you on the line? Yeah, I'm here, Neil. How are you? Okay, awesome. Rob, you're the author of Un-American Genocidal Complex. Thanks for calling the program. And I did send you this article, and it, it, it interests you, doesn't it? This whole Tennessee pushes legislation to safeguard anti-evolution teachers. What's your thought? Well, um, they're doing the right thing. I mean, scientifically, I mean, creationism is, is absolutely the, the correct science, and Darwinism is, a, uh, is basically a scientific joke and a complete farce. But I know a lot of our so-called progressive educators and, you know, the enlightened ones amongst us will uh, no doubt uh, bash Tennessee for being a bunch of rednecks and hillbillies or whatever the latest catchphrase is. But uh, good for them. Jason, your comment. Jason, the public school guy, is on with us. He's my co-host, and I, I, he's been really an advocate of saying this is ridiculous. And, Jason, what would you like to respond to Rob about that? Well, I mean, I'm not going to go as far as calling people names. I, that, that's not quite fair either. But, I mean, to be honest with you, this is a movement that was started uh, recently um, in, in Kansas as an, as an effort by the evangelical movement, uh, particularly the Christian right, people such as uh, uh, Dr. James Dobson and uh, in his organization, to, to interject um, a, a religious alternative to what, is, what has been considered scientific fact. And I, you know, I mean, we can all make these arguments, and we can use hyperbole, and we can say things that, that raise emotions. But the fact of the matter is, scientifically, if you talk to 95% of the of scientists out there, they'll say that Darwinism is fact. Now, and, and, and I have, you know, in preparation for this, I talked to a number of people who teach biology in public schools, and they do address e e evolution in the classroom. It doesn't need to be. It didn't need to be made law. By the, st by the Tennessee State uh, uh, Congress, or be, be, be made law by Tennessee State Congress. Rob, your response? I, I, I don't know where to begin. I mean, 95% of biologists, so what? Uh, you know, look, <laughs> it's Darwinism, only science. Darwinism as, as science, okay, uh, is a scientific hoax uh, of unprecedented proportions, okay? Um, oh, it absolutely is religion. Okay, because it's the only it's it's motive is to eliminate a creator uh, of the universe. Okay, you, 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 I don't even know where to begin. Uh, you know, talking about the laws of thermodynamics, Newton's laws of motion, uh, Darwinism con doesn't even, well, it doesn't even address Newton's laws of motion, the Big Bang theory. I mean, that contradicts. So we, don't, we can't even get to the physical laws uh, without getting out of the, the realm of Darwinism. Now, I want somebody to explain to me what substance. Uh, started it all. I mean, how did how did the the human brain, for example, evolve from slime or from fish? You know, for, forget God, forget religion, forget right wing and Christian fundamentalists and all this other stuff. I want a specific scientific book that I can go into a lab and demonstrate that some kind of slime uh, turns into the human brain. Hey, I, I I got a pencil and paper right here. I'll write down the ISBN number and the title. Uh, I want to go into a lab and be able to demonstrate. Uh, evolution. Now, I don't care if 99.9% .9 of the bi biologists so-called in this country support this. They, there's not one that can name a valid scientific experiment that Darwinism is real. Okay, and the reason I, I, I because this, this is the, the crux of the problem here. They've taken God out of society 
uh, and it all started with Darwinism, so it's much bigger than, than quote, just science, okay? That, that's what's really going on here. Jason. <laughs> wow. Okay. Uh, I, I don't know of a specific book in which you can write down an ISBN and, and, and all that kind of thing. <laughs> that's, so that's a lot of posturing, and, that, and that's wonderful. You, you certainly have your point of view. But the fact of the matter is, if you really want to look and see how uh, evolution has occurred over time, all you have to do is talk to a paleontologist. Look at, the, look at, at fossils and look at how they have developed over time. You can look at how dinosaurs have developed over time. Now, I understand that there's an argument against it using carbon-14 dating and how somehow there's some kind of irradiation that doesn't allow for carbon-14 dating to be considered accurate. And, and you can make all those scientific arguments, but those, all of these arguments have been refuted by the scientists, not just in uh, bi biological standards, but by all standards. And, and let's be perfectly clear about this. Every single time that a an argument ma is made by the creationist side that says that if this is against God, no one has mentioned anything about God on the on the evolutionary side. And, and it's the creationists who are trying to turn this into see, a see, God. No, see, I would God disagree. Thing. I would disagree, Jason. And remember, I told you before, I put the whole Catholic Church spin on things and how they, we should teach evolution, but ultimately. Creationism should not be taught because, again, it's a, it's a, it's theology, not religion. But again, Rob would disagree. I mean, that fact. I'm just giving the whole Catholic perspective on this. But Jason, to really think what they used evolution to do is to debunk God altogether. Many no. evolutionists. Yes, that's true. Uh, Rob, is that true? God. Is that true? That's, that's, that's absolutely true. Darwin did not but, go but, to the can can I, I, looking for God. Can I ask a question? The reason you don't mention God is because God doesn't exist. So that, that, that's a, a, a well, extremely... Well, that may be your belief. It's certainly not mine. That's an extremely poor argument. Well, okay? that's now, you're, now, you may not believe in God. I uh, do. But I also, don't, I also don't think that Darwin went out to disprove God either. I think oh, that's he a very narrow point Jason, of view. Come on. Jason, I mean, Jason look, definitely Darwin did go out to disprove God. I mean, no, uh, they, he you, didn't. You, As a you, matter of fact, he was a church-going member of the, uh, of, of, of the Church of England. No, no. Well, well is, yeah, that, is, yeah. that a, is that a real church? No, but the fact of the matter well, is... It was a little long ago for certain people. No, no, no. But let, let me give you the point, Jason. And I want Rob to respond to this, because Rob, you're the debater on this end. But come on now, Jason. Ultimately, people out there that are atheists believe in evolution because there's no God. That's one of the reasons. They want that to be their That's thing. Their is it, is that true, Rob? Rob. Look, 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 look. I mean, you know... You, Again, we're stuck. We're in the realm of just just biological life, okay, and so-called evolution. Now you say you know scientists refute this. Uh, you know, according to the sources I read, is everything from Neanderthal man to Lucy uh, to Nebraska man. You know, these are all uh, Haeckel's drawings. You know, where you know or fish, an embryo of a fish supposedly became human. Uh, all this stuff has been already been established as, as blatant scientific fraud. Okay, but that, 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 that being said. That being said, okay, look, we can argue to the cows come home, all right? We only have a couple minutes here. But let me ask you a question. You know, forget, just be objective. Why did, why did evolution stop, and when did it stop? Evolution hasn't tell me. stopped. What? Evolution hasn't stopped. Really? Evolution continues. The problem is, and, and, and here, here's the crux of the problem of this argument, and again, this, is what, this has been argued over and over again with this topic, is that, you know, the creationist point of view looks at this topic and says, well, where is that? Where is evolution at right now? Evolution happens over hundreds of thousands of years. Now, if you want to look okay. at how things have changed, take a look at how man has changed. If you want to look at these quick, look, quick view of evolution, is look, take a look at how much we have changed in a short period of time since the beginning of the second industrial revolution. Before then, we were very skinny, we were very short, and we were not, and we were not well developed mentally. Why? Because we had poor nutrition and because our conditions did not allow us to do so. Second, well, well, second okay, well, 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 let me finish my point. Okay, well, second industrial revolution comes around, okay. food and cars and transportation become better, nutrition becomes better, and now we are taller, we are bigger, we are stronger, and we are faster than we were 100 to 150 years ago whenever the second industrial revolution, revolution occurred. Okay, Rob, I know what I want. I kinda, I'm teasing my listeners. Go to the Tittle Education Network, especially TotalTutor.org, and you're going to find out about Rob Rosselli's big uh, evolution debate on April 20th. Because I tell you right now, 
some anti some pro evolution people are going to be on the program. Tell us more information on you real quick, Rob, before we have to take a break. Well, my, my website's boxofsunglasses.com, and I invite this gentleman, if you go to the homepage, to take my test of evolutionary knowledge because there's much more to it than just biological life, which is a joke to begin with. I mean, you've got to start explaining the Big Bang uh, and the contradiction of Newton's laws of motion and the laws of thermodynamics and the hydrologic cycle and the carbon cycle and every other cycle uh, that all came from this random explosion. I mean, it, it, it is a scientific joke. I don't care how many people and so-called biologists that have been re-educated uh, support this scam. All right? It's that simple. <laughs> Jason. Go ahead and laugh, right? It's funny, but, you know, I, what, what, what was Taylor trying to do? I mean, he was taking Charlie at his work. Okay, so go ahead and laugh. Right? It's it's funny. Funny. I, I happened, big All right. You use this hyperbole. You use words yeah. in okay. order to gain, to gain I, people's I, emotional okay. support. I, I Hitler, okay. really? So, Jason, you want to you yeah. debate him again? We can definitely. Any day of the week. Okay. And, and, bring, and, and bring along the, the top physicists you can find. Well, okay. you, you, bring, you, bring along this, you bring along the scientists that can prove your fraud, is, uh, your fraud of a side, too. Please. All right. I don't, All right. I don't need to. I don't need to. J I'll be by myself. So, Rob, Rob, <laughs> Jason, the public school guy, where can you find more information on you? Oh, yeah, my website, Total. Tutor.org. And you Google search Jason the Public School Guy, it comes up first for all my listeners out there. And also television, Rob, because we're on TV as well. So uh, we'll definitely send a picture. Rob, I really want to thank you for calling in. You really provided some great information to look at this whole evolutionary debate. We will continue this debate on April 20th. Thanks for calling the program. All right, Dale. Thanks a lot. All right, Have take a good care. Weekend. All right, you too. And Jason, thanks yeah. for calling the program as well. Anytime. Have a good one. So you're listening to the Total Education Hour, and wow, we went from nonfiction to evolution. Where are we going next after this break? We'll be back in just a moment. And now, another adventure with Savings Man. And with 0% down, all you have to pay on this mortgage is the interest. Now that's affordable. Are you sure? Savings man. Watch out, you two. This is not your typical mortgage guy. He's really a subprime mate. Out you go. Monkeying around with the wrong mortgage can destroy your dreams. You're right, savings man. Remember, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. For more tips and tools, visit choosetosave.org today. Is that thing getting closer? Look how high that thing's going. Look out there, look at the debris. Oh. Uh, give me the camera. No, no, just drive, I've got it. Zoom in, zoom in. You can't believe this is happening. Oh, what the size of that thing? It's everywhere. Are you getting this? Yeah, I've got it. What was that? It's the National Guard. How'd they get here so fast? I don't know. Pull over, pull over. Do you have what it takes to head into the heart of the storm? Check out nationalguard.com. The American Legion, we're a powerful force for the nation. We pledge ourselves to our veterans, our youth, a strong national defense, and Americanism. These four pillars shape our work and what we do for America. We work relentlessly within our four pillars of service, and we succeed. We're committed to making sure all veterans receive the benefits they deserve for the sacrifices they've made in service to America. We support and promote citizenship and integrity in America's future leaders. We know what policies, tools, and manpower our military needs to protect this great country. We fight to get these things done. We're patriots through and through. We promote and defend these values every day in communities across the nation. Go to legion.org to find out more about the American Legion's commitment of service to America. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the Total Education Hour. I'm the host of the show, Neil Haley. Please go to my website at totaltutor.org. And now I do have my guest on the line, Susan Glazier, author of Who's the Boss?, Thanks for calling the program. You're my regular Thursday night guest on one of the Total Education Network stations. Thanks for calling the program. Oh, my pleasure, Neil. So, Susan, now the topic I sent, and I don't know if I want to, because I think you really did research and look at this, is the whole thing about D.C. charters tackle preschool. And I know for a fact this is something that the Bronx teacher absolutely does not like. 
Uh, I know a lot, TFT, and again, I have a lot of fans that listen to all Total Education Network shows because it airs other places, so people might say, Bronx Teacher, TFT, well, you got to go to my website to learn more information on them. But they think this is crazy to challenge preschool students with writing, with expectations, high expectations, not allowing scribbling. But I wanted to take an early childhood expert and see this article, and what do you think? Well, you know, that's very interesting that you mentioned two things in the in the same sentence. You, men you mentioned, you know, like forcing writing and high expectations and not allowing scribbling. And it's interesting because um, reading, uh, excuse me, writing actually precedes reading. But writing doesn't mean that you expect a pre-K or a three-year-old or a four-year-old to sit down and stay within the lines and write right, their letters exactly. correctly. What it means is that you is that you have to give children ample opportunity for writing. That means when I say I've just started, in fact, I think I told you, I think I wrote you a quick note, Neil, that oddly enough, I am working with a charter school in Cleveland, Ohio. Oh, wow. And we are actually trying to align a pre-K curriculum so that these children will be better prepared to go into kindergarten. Fantastic. And so I'm, this is like exactly what I'm doing, like, it, it, like right at this moment. And what I'm doing in the pre-K, for instance, is that I just introduced a whole journaling project. And it was, we, it was a very long process in how we introduced the journals. We made it like a part of a treasure map. We made it very exciting. We talked about books in general. Children need to be able to handle books. Do they know how to go from, you know, from left to right, from front to back, and not have the book upside down? Children who are not exposed to a lot of reading in their homes, that's what they need exposure to in the school setting. Right, so exactly. that's what doing with the teachers but in terms of the journaling we were absolutely amazed these children saw these as their very own books they decorated the front those who could write their name and they all cannot write their name but you know we helped those wrote their names on it or any way that they thought represented their name and then they opened their books and neil this is what we saw literally the entire spectrum of what one would expect to see in a pre-k class wow. we saw some children just scribbling we saw some children where letter formation was beginning little squares and circles that looked a little bit like letters but they weren't really letters we saw most of the children were doing letter strings you know what i you know yes, what i mean yes. by that just just strings of letters and they would come to me and they'd say well what did i write and i'd say well you tell me read me what you wrote and then they would dictate these wonderful stories, which we would write down. And there were one, there were one or two children that had really incorporated things like words like stop or go or mom, you know, things that they have yes. seen written, environmental print. And that, if you, if you, if you mean, if, if they mean um, a charter school, this is how my, I want my charter school to do it anyway, this is something that's incredibly appropriate. It allows children to write which precedes reading. It gives them that idea that letters get grouped together to form words, and the words form sentences, and the sentences form thoughts and ideas. Well, Susan, very interesting. And now I'm seeing another side of you, because you're a parent expert, but then going into the, I knew your early childhood, but absolutely. This is one of the things that I think makes unions really mad, is the fact that you know what? These charter schools are challenging these kids. They're creating yeah. these pre-K programs. But oh yeah, you we only and here's the thing they say, Susan is well, you only you only pick a certain few of children that come to these charter schools, and you don't you don't pick everyone. So that's why charter school everything's wrong with charter schools. But don't you think, Susan? Maybe the public schools need to think about taking what the charter schools are doing and hiring you out to consult with them as a more of a situation or I mean use your consultation services instead of debunking that this should not be do going on yeah. you cannot just make a blanket statement and debunk it and by the way the charter school that I'm working with it's first come first serve <laughs> children are not tested to get in there okay. by the way only the only children who get in automatically are those with siblings which makes sense so it first of all not all charter schools just pick and choose you know, like the, the students that they think are going to be right. So that's, I have to just say that. Yeah, I actually think that what we really need in early childhood is a big shakeup. We need yes. to see kindergarten as a part of the continuum of preschool. It's pre-K, kindergarten, first grade. 
children don't automatically, from the time that they finish pre-K, like in July or, you know, if they go full year, they don't suddenly become great, like fifth graders in a no, month. No, not at all. They have to, you have to ease them into it. So we have to get away from the idea that only worksheets and paper and pencil tasks are the way that children learn. People in early childhood understand that children learn by being in, in authentic settings. And that's kind of a... Oh, one of those buzzwords in early childhood. Authentic, Authentic yes. means, like I, for instance, to give you an example, because not every child loves to go to their journal, I put little clipboards in the block corner, in the dramatic play corner, and you know what happens? I have children labeling their buildings and kids taking, writing down recipes or taking orders in a pretend restaurant. I don't care where they write, <laughs> you know, as long as they're, and when I say writing, it's some of it's just scribbling or just letter strings, of course. And kindergarten, they, they need to just take the children where they are, uh, it's called scaffolding, and then just keep adding yes. layers to it. It's, it is doable, and, um, and, and there really cannot be this, this, this strict division between, oh, this is pre-K, and now suddenly you're in kindergarten. You got it. And you can't have that. And the fact is that so many learners are so diverse, and the, the expectations yeah. should be different. But I think what charter schools do is they individualize instruction more, don't they? You know, I don't know about, I'm only working with my own, okay, my okay. own charter school, but I have to say that what they do is that they utilize um, um, volunteers. So because they're a charter school, they have tapped into um, very already established volunteer organizations. And so I see volunteers there constantly, and that is individualized because they will take out just one child at a time, you know, a child who is struggling in a certain area. I don't want to let go what you said, very, very important point, that children do not all learn the same. Not every child is a visual learner or an auditory learner, and very often younger children learn kinesthetically or tactically, um, and we need, to, we need to really think about that, not just in pre-K, but through kindergarten and first grade until children um, you know, can really develop the kinds of, I'll call it quote-unquote, school skills that will take them further. I don't know, but that's an important point, Neil. I'm glad you brought great, that up. Great, great point. And you, I guess you agree with what DC is doing, providing uh, the uh, early, the pre, the uh, pre-K programs and stuff. They, that's... As long as they're done, as long as they are developmentally appropriate. I mean, if I went into a pre-K class and I saw the teachers having them sit down and write in, you know, in lines and worksheets, no, I wouldn't be in favor of it. But when I, but if, but I, that's not my sense of it. My sense of it from reading these articles is that they understand that children need to move their bodies. They need to be a dynamic partner in the learning. They don't need to just be an empty receptacle that the teacher's stuffing information in because that's really not the way young children learn best. Okay, Susan, where can we find more information on you? You can find uh, my books on our website, which is wtboss.com or on Amazon. The name of the book is Who's the Boss? Well, I, I appreciate you calling, Susan, and really, you're going to be a monthly guest on the program, so we're going to keep looking at the early childhood uh, education topics and things, but I really believe that we need to push these kids in a way to prepare them for kindergarten, because yeah. kindergarten is such an important time, and if I, kids struggle in kindergarten, Susan, they're going to be lost, aren't they? I absolutely agree, and, and that's... This is the balance. That this is where people get a bit confused. And I'll just my ending point will be: you can do all of those things. Get these children ready to write, ready to read, understand about word families, beginning sounds, without having it look like a, a fifth grade classroom. It's, uh, it's possible. I do it. I've done it for years. <laughs> oh, you, you absolutely, absolutely, Susan. And thanks for again. We can find oh. Susan on Thursday nights on one of my Total Education Network stations, and you can learn more by going to her website. Susan, thanks for calling the program. Thank you, Neil. And you have a, you have a great uh, evening, great weekend, and I'll talk to you soon, okay? Great, great. Bye-bye, Neil. All right, that was Susan Glazier, author of Who's the Boss? I cannot believe how quickly this hour went. I'm just shocked. What awesome guests we had. I want to thank Vicki Cobb and Penny Coleman for calling the program the nonfiction writers. So if you authors, if you want to learn more information, go to totaltutor.org and re-listen to the show because it'll be on uh, one of my networks. And also, I really like this whole Rob Rosselli versus Jason the Public School guy debate. It was it was an, it really interesting. I think it got heated 
And now you all are going to call me and say, you know what, Total Tutor, what you do is you go and set up somebody else for um, for failure. No, I don't do that at all. Jason was prepared. He knew what was he was getting himself into. But we bring both sides of the argument on the Total Education Hour. We don't, and especially the Total Education Network. We don't want just one side of the story like some stations out there. And education talk, come on now. Oh, we need it needs to be touchy feely. It's not going to be touchy feely with Neil Haley, the total tutor. I'm sorry. It's not going to be, and I'll refuse. Well, tonight on one of my uh, uh, on the Teleeducation Network on one of my stations, I'll be having a homeschool roundtable discussion, and it's going to be phenomenal. Homeschool parents will call the program. And if you are listening to this as a podcast, I'm sure you can find that information really quickly by Google searching education talk shows. Remember to write an iTunes review. Go to iTunes, search Total Education Network, and guess what? Write an iTunes review. I want to thank Christopher Perone for being my phenomenal producer and my television producer, Christina. And I hope we're going to see her every week because, again, we're on television as well. Go to the website, totaltutor.org, to learn more information. I hope everyone has a great evening, and I'll talk to you next week at 4.30. Good night. divide my allowance. Some to spend, some to charity. But the first thing I do is set aside 10% to save for my future. That's awfully grown up. Did you learn that in school? No. Dad taught me. He said if you want something tomorrow, you have to save today. Dad's saving for retirement. I'm saving for a new bike. Choose to save. To learn how to get started, get your free Power to Choose brochure. He's a smart man, your father. Our fugitive has been on the run for 90 minutes. Average foot speed over uneven terrain, barring any injuries of four miles per hour. What I need from each and every one of you is a full target search of every gas station, residence, warehouse, farmhouse, hen house, outhouse, and dog house in that area. Your fugitive has just cashed in his 401k plan. And all he had to do was roll it over. Learn about rollovers and protecting your financial future. And choose to save. You can't mess with a big dog. Delhi is a mad, chaotic place at first glance, but there is a method to the madness somewhere. I've lived in Delhi all my life and I have seen the weather change. The monsoon this year has been more erratic than I can ever remember. It's at least a month and a half late. We've had, I think, highest temperature in the last 50 years. Growing up, you'd wait for a squall. It was short, it was intense, but it used to come nearly every evening, sometime in the beginning of the summer. This year, there's not a drop. Climate change is, is something that uh, affects everyone. It's not class specific or society specific. Some, some estimates say 2017 Delhi, 15 million people are going to be without water. It's, it's quite scary living in Delhi and knowing that. <laughs>